Chapter Six, Part Two of the Water Babies by Charles Kingsley, read for LibriVox.org by Corrie Samuel. Little boys who are only fit to play with sea beasts cannot go there," she said. "Those who go there must go first where they do not like, and do what they do not like, and help somebody they do not like." Why, did Ellie do that? Ask her. And Ellie blushed and said. Yes, Tom, I did not like coming here at first. I was so much happier at home, where it is always Sunday. And I was afraid of you, Tom, at first, because—because—because because, because I was all over prickles. But I am not prickly now, am I, Miss Ellie?" No, said Ellie, I like you very much now, and I like coming here, too. And perhaps, said the fairy, you will learn to like going where you do not like, and helping someone that you don't like as Ellie has." But Tom put his finger in his mouth, and hung his head down, for he did not see that at all. So when Mrs. Do-as-you-would-be-done-by came, Tom asked her, for he thought in his little head, she is not so strict as her sister, and perhaps she may let me off more easily. Ah, Tom, Tom, silly fellow! And yet I don't know why I should blame you while so many grown people have got the very same notion in their heads. But when they try it, they get just the same answer as Tom did. For when he asked the second fairy, she told him just what the first did, and in the very same words. Tom was very unhappy at that, and when Ellie went home on Sunday, he fretted and cried all day, and did not care to listen to the fairy's stories about good children, though they were prettier than ever. Indeed, the more he overheard of them, the less he liked to listen, because they were all about children who did what they did not like, and took trouble for other people, and worked to feed their little brothers and sisters, instead of caring only for their play. And when she began to tell a story about a holy child in old times, who was martyred by the heathen because it would not worship idols, Tom could bear no more, and ran away and hid among the rocks. And, when Ellie came back, he was quite shy with her, because he fancied she looked down on him, and thought him a coward. And then he grew quite cross with her, because she was superior to him, and did what he could not do. And poor Ellie was quite surprised, and sad. And at last Tom burst out crying, but he would not tell her what was really in his mind. And all the while he was eaten up with curiosity, to know where Ellie went to, so that he began not to care for his playmates or for the sea-palace, or anything else. But perhaps that made matters all the easier for him, for he grew so discontented with everything round him that he did not care to stay, and did not care where he went. Well, he said at last, I am so miserable here, I'll go. If only you will go with me. Ah, said Ellie, I wish I might, but the worst of it is that the fairy says that you must go alone if you go at all. Now don't poke that poor crab about, Tom, for he was feeling very naughty and mischievous, or the fairy will have to punish you. Tom was very nearly saying, I don't care if she does, but he stopped himself in time. I know what she wants me to do, he said, whining most dolefully. She wants me to go after that horrid old Grimes. I don't like him, that's certain, and if I find him he will turn me into a chimney-sweep again, I know. That's what I have been afraid of all along. No, he won't. I know as much as that. Nobody can turn water babies into sweeps, or hurt them at all, as long as they are good. Ah, said Naughty Tom, I see what you want. You are persuading me all along to go, because you are tired of me and want to get rid of me. Little Ellie opened her eyes very wide at that, and they were all brimming over with tears. Oh, Tom, Tom! she said very mournfully. And then she cried, Oh, Tom, where are you? And Tom cried, Oh, Ellie, where are you? For neither of them could see each other, not the least. Little Ellie vanished quite away, and Tom heard her voice calling him, and growing smaller and smaller, and fainter and fainter, till all was silent. Who was frightened then but Tom? He swam up and down among the rocks, into all the halls and chambers, faster than ever he swam before, 
but could not find her. He shouted after her, but she did not answer. He asked all the other children, but they had not seen her. And at last he went up to the top of the water, and began crying and screaming for Mrs. Be Done By As You Did, which perhaps was the best thing to do, for she came in a moment. Oh! said Tom. Oh dear, oh dear! I have been naughty to Ellie, and I have killed her. I know I have killed her. Not quite that, said the fairy. But I have sent her away home, and she will not come back again, for I do not know how long. And at that Tom cried so bitterly that the salt sea was swelled with his tears, and the tide was point three nine five four six two zero eight one nine of an inch higher than it had been the day before but perhaps that was owing to the waxing of the moon. It may have been so, but it is considered right, in the new philosophy, you know, to give spiritual causes for physical phenomena, especially in parlour tables, and, of course, physical causes for spiritual ones, like thinking, and praying, and knowing right from wrong. And so they odds it till it comes even, as people say down in Berkshire. How cruel of you to send Ellie away! sobbed Tom. However, I will find her again, if I go to the world's end to look for her." The fairy did not slap Tom, and tell him to hold his tongue, but she took him on her lap very kindly, just as her sister would have done, and put him in mind how it was not her fault, because she was wound up inside, like watches, and could not help doing things whether she liked or not. And then she told him how he had been in the nursery long enough and must go out now and see the world, if he intended ever to be a man, and how he must go all alone by himself, as every one else that ever was born has to go, and see with his own eyes, and smell with his own nose, and make his own bed and lie on it, and burn his own fingers if he put them into the fire. And then she told him how many fine things there were to be seen in the world and what an odd, curious, pleasant, orderly, respectable, well-managed, and on the whole successful, as indeed might have been expected, sort of place it was, if only people would be tolerably brave and honest and good in it. And then she told him not to be afraid of anything he met, for nothing would harm him if he remembered all his lessons, and did what he knew was right. And at last she comforted poor little Tom so much that he was quite eager to go, and wanted to set out that minute. "'Only,' he said, "'if I might see Ellie once before I went.' "'Why do you want that?' "'Because—because I should be so much happier if I thought she had forgiven me.' And in the twinkling of an eye there stood Ellie, smiling, and looking so happy that Tom longed to kiss her, but was still afraid it would not be respectful because she was a lady born. "'I am going, Ellie,' said Tom. "'I am going, if it is to the world's end. But I don't like going at all, and that's the truth.' "'Poo, poo, poo,' said the fairy. "'You will like it very well indeed, you little rogue, and you know that at the bottom of your heart. But if you don't, I will make you like it. Come here, and see what happens to people who only do what is pleasant.' And she took out of one of her cupboards she had all sorts of mysterious cupboards in the cracks of the rocks, the most wonderful waterproof book, full of such photographs as never were seen. For she had found out photography, and this is a fact, more than thirteen million five hundred ninety-eight thousand years before anybody was born. And what is more, her photographs did not merely represent light and shade, as ours do, but colour also, and all colours, as you may see if you look at a black cock's tail or a butterfly's wing, or indeed most things that are, or can be, so to speak. And therefore her photographs were very curious and famous, and the children looked with great delight for the opening of the book. And on the title page was written, The History of the Great and Famous Nation of the Doers You Likes, who came away from the country of hard work, because they wanted to play on the Jew's harp all day long. In the first picture, they saw these do-as-you-likes, living in the land of Ready-Made, at the foot of the Happy-Go-Lucky Mountains, where Flapdoodle grows wild, and if you want to know what that is, you must read Peter Simple. They lived very much such a life as those jolly old Greeks in Sicily, 
whom you may see painted on the ancient vases. And really there seemed to be great excuses for them, for they had no need to work. Instead of houses, they lived in the beautiful caves of Tuffa, and bathed in the warm springs three times a day. And as for clothes, it was so warm there that the gentlemen walked about in little besides a cocked hat and a pair of straps, or some light summer tackle of that kind. And the ladies all gathered gossamer in autumn, when they were not too lazy, to make their winter dresses. They were very fond of music, but it was too much trouble to learn the piano or the violin, and as for dancing, that would have been too great an exertion. So they sat on ant hills all day long, and played on the Jew's harp, and, if the ants bit them, why, they just got up and went to the next ant hill, till they were bitten there likewise. And they sat under the flapdoodle trees, and let the flapdoodle drop into their mouths, and under the vines, and squeezed the grape juice down their throats, and, if any little pigs ran about ready roasted, crying, Come and eat me! as was their fashion in that country. They waited till the pigs ran against their mouths, and then took a bite, and were content, just as so many oysters would have been. They needed no weapons, for no enemies ever came near their land, and no tools, for everything was ready-made to their hand, and the stern old fairy necessity never came near them to hunt them up, and make them use their wits, or die. And so on, and so on, and so on till there never were such comfortable, easy-going, happy-go-lucky people in the world. "'Well, that is a jolly life,' said Tom. "'You think so?' said the fairy. "'Do you see that great peaked mountain there behind?' said the fairy, "'with smoke coming out of its top?' "'Yes. "'And do you see all those ashes and slag and cinders lying about?' "'Yes.' Then turn over the next five hundred years, and you will see what happens next. And behold, the mountain had blown up like a barrel of gunpowder, and then boiled over like a kettle, whereby one third of the do-as-you-likes were blown into the air, and another third was smothered in ashes, so that there was only one third left. You see, said the fairy, what comes of living on a burning mountain? Oh, why did you not warn them? said little Ellie. I did warn them all that I could. I let the smoke come out of the mountain, and wherever there is smoke there is fire. And I laid the ashes and cinders all about, and wherever there are cinders, cinders may be again. But they did not like to face facts, my dears, as very few people do, and so they invented a cock-and-bull story, which I am sure I never told them, that the smoke was the breath of a giant, whom some gods or other had buried under the mountain, and that the cinders were what the dwarves roasted the little pigs whole with, and other nonsense of that kind. And when folks are in that humour, I cannot teach them, save by the good old birch rod. And then she turned over the next five hundred years, and there were the remnant of the do-as-you-likes, doing as they liked, as before. They were too lazy to move away from the mountain, so they said, If it has blown up once, that is all the more reason that it should not blow up again and they were few in number, but they only said, The more the merrier, but the fewer the better fare. However, that was not quite true, for all the flapdoodle trees were killed by the volcano, and they had eaten all the roast pigs, who, of course, could not be expected to have little ones. So they had to live very hard on nuts and roots, which they scratched out of the ground with sticks. Some of them talked of sowing corn, as their ancestors used to do, before they came into the land of ready-made. But they had forgotten how to make ploughs, they had forgotten even how to make Jews' harps by this time, and had eaten all the seed-corn which they brought out of the land of hard work years since, and of course it was too much trouble to go away and find more. So they lived miserably on roots and nuts, and all the weakly little children had great stomachs and then died. Why, said Tom, they are growing no better than savages. "'And look how ugly they are all getting,' said Ellie. "'Yes. When people live on poor vegetables, instead of roast beef and plum pudding, their jaws grow large and their lips grow coarse, like the poor paddies who eat potatoes.' And she turned over the next five hundred years. And there they were, all living up in trees, and making nests to keep off the rain. 
and underneath the trees lions were prowling about. "'Why?' said Ellie. "'The lions seem to have eaten a good many of them, for there are very few left now.' "'Yes,' said the fairy. "'You see, it was only the strongest and most active ones who could climb the trees, and so escape.' "'But what great hulking broad-shouldered chaps they are,' said Tom. "'They are a rough lot as ever I saw.' "'Yes, they are getting very strong now, for the ladies will not marry any but the very strongest and fiercest gentlemen, who can help them up the trees out of the lion's way.' And she turned over the next five hundred years. And in that they were fewer still, and stronger and fiercer. But their feet had changed shape very oddly for they laid hold of the branches with their great toes, as if they had been thumbs, just as a Hindu tailor uses his toes to thread his needle. The children were very much surprised, and asked the fairy whether that was her doing. "'Yes and no,' she said, smiling. "'It was only those who could use their feet as well as their hands, who could get a good living, or indeed get married, so that they got the best of everything, and starved out all the rest.' and those who are left keep up a regular breed of toe-thumb men, as a breed of short-horns, or our sky-terriers, or fancy-pigeons is kept up." "'But there is a hairy one among them,' said Ellie. "'Ah,' said the fairy, "'that will be a great man in his time, and chief of all the tribe.'" And when she turned over the next five hundred years, it was true. For this hairy chief had had hairy children and they hairier children still, and every one wished to marry hairy husbands, and have hairy children too, for the climate was growing so damp that none but the hairy ones could live. All the rest coughed and sneezed, and had sore throats, and went into consumptions, before they could grow up to be men and women. Then the fairy turned over the next five hundred years, and they were fewer still. "'Why, there is one on the ground picking up roots,' said Ellie and he cannot walk upright." No more he could, for in the same way that the shape of their feet had altered, the shape of their backs had altered too. "'Why,' cried Tom, "'I declare they are all apes!' "'Something fearfully like it, poor foolish creatures,' said the fairy. "'They are grown so stupid now that they can hardly think, for none of them have used their wits for many hundred years. They have almost forgotten, too, how to talk for each stupid child forgot some of the words it heard from its stupid parents, and had not wits enough to make fresh words for itself. Beside, they are grown so fierce and suspicious and brutal that they keep out of each other's way, and mope and sulk in the dark forests, never hearing each other's voice, till they have forgotten almost what speech is like. I am afraid they will all be apes very soon, and all by doing only what they liked." and in the next five hundred years they were all dead and gone, by bad food and wild beasts and hunters, all except one tremendous old fellow with jaws like a jack, who stood full seven feet high, and Monsieur de Chelieu came up to him and shot him as he stood roaring and thumping his breast. And he remembered that his ancestors had once been men, and tried to say, Am I not a man and a brother? but had forgotten how to use his tongue. And then he had tried to call for a doctor, but he had forgotten the word for one. So all he said was, Ububu, and died. And that was the end of the great and jolly notion of the do-as-you-likes. And, when Tom and Ellie came to the end of the book, they looked very sad and solemn, and they had good reason so to do, for they really fancied that the men were apes, and never thought, in their simplicity, of asking whether the creatures had hippopotamus majors in their brains or not, in which case, as you have been told already, they could not possibly have been apes, though they were more apish than the apes of all aperies. "'But could you not have saved them from becoming apes?' said little Ellie, at last. "'At first, my dear, if only they would have behaved like men, and set to work to do what they did not like.' But the longer they waited, and behaved like the dumb beasts, who only do what they like, the stupider and clumsier they grew, till at last they were past all cure, for they had thrown their own wits away. It is such things as this that help to make me so ugly, 
that I know not when I shall grow fair. And where are they all now? asked Ellie. Exactly where they ought to be, my dear. Yes, said the fairy solemnly, half to herself as she closed the wonderful book. Folks say now that I can make beasts into men by circumstance and selection and competition and so forth. Well, perhaps they are right, and perhaps again they are wrong. That is one of the seven things which I am forbidden to tell till the coming of the coxigrues, and, at all events, it is no concern of theirs. Whatever their ancestors were, men they are, and I advise them to behave as such and act accordingly. But let them recollect this, that there are two sides to every question, and a downhill as well as an uphill road. And, if I can turn beasts into men, I can, by the same laws of circumstance and selection and competition, turn men into beasts. You were very near being turned into a beast once or twice, little Tom. Indeed, if you had not made up your mind to go on this journey, and see the world like an Englishman. I am not sure but that you would have ended as an eft in a pond." "'Oh, dear me,' said Tom, "'sooner than that, and be all over slime. I'll go this minute, if it's to the world's end.'" End of chapter 6, part 2 This recording is in the public domain.